you have your personal Bible or your pew Bible, please turn to Psalms 98, 1 through 6. Psalms 98, 1 through 6.
118, verse number 23 and 24. We're going to take a look at Psalm 118 and verse 23. I'm going to read 23 and we'll read 24 all together. In Psalm 118, verse 23, we find these words. It says, the Lord, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. All together, this is the day which the Lord has made.
Bible says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also weep sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall also weep bountifully. Every man according as his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful. <laughs> to be able to give and pour into this ministry, we just encourage you to go to TrinityNBCMadisonville.com and click on the word give.
Christ. It is indeed a great opportunity and privilege to mount this pulpit once again to share with you what thus saith the Lord. I'm not feeling too well today, so y'all pray with me. Y'all give me a couple of amens. I might give you my best three minutes. If y'all go, I got 50. So I'm going to direct your attention to Psalm 50, Psalm 50 this morning. And there's a couple of nuggets in Psalm 50 that grab my attention. Psalm 50. We're going to take a look at verses 10 through 12. Psalm 50, 10 through 12. Psalm 50, 10 through 12. And it's a reminder for us that God wants to communicate to us. When you have found Psalm 50, verse number 10, go ahead and stand to your feet. Psalm 50, verse number 10. If we need a little bit more time, say, wait a minute, preacher. Amen. Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Verse number 10, Psalm 50, verse number 10. And in Psalm 50, verse number 10, we find these words. Read with me. It says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the air, of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Amen. Today's sermon title is, That's Who He Is, Part Number Two. You can take your seats. That's Who He Is, Part Two. It is important, it is critical that we fully understand who God is. If we really knew who God is, we would line up in front of this church on Friday, spend the weekend, all weekend long, so that we could make sure that we could get a seat in the sanctuary. If we knew who he is, we would be upset when worship service was over. We would be demanding for an encore. We would be waving our hands, shouting at the top of our lungs if we knew who he is. We would crowd the pulpit. We would just have a strong desire just to reach out and touch him, to hold on to him, to never let him go. Just wanting to be in his presence. If we knew who he is, we wouldn't like be waking up on Sunday morning saying, I have to go to church, but I get to go to church. See, get is an opportunity that has intentionality around it. Get has an excitement factor to it. If we knew who he is, we can understand why the psalmist says that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. See, God is our security. God is our strong and mighty fortress. God is with me in the time of trouble. He present help. He didn't say he would remove you from your situation. He said he would be there right there with you in your situation. Protecting you. Shielding you. Walking with you. And when you get tired, that's when God picks you up. And he carries you the rest of the way. I understand now why the psalmist said that they all are walk through the valley and the shadow of death. I feel no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. That's just simply who he is. You can call him your savior. I call him my strong tower. You can call him your redeemer. I call him my mighty helper. You can call him your bridge over troubled waters. I like to call him my way maker. I just want to stop by to tell you that's who he is. There's three particular nuggets in this text that grab my attention. The first one is, it's mine. It's important for you to know that some stuff belongs to the Lord. Just a little background in Psalm number 50. God shows up as our judge. He is bringing charges against his people, demanding and dealing with this particular aspect. Man's formalized 
form of worship, and number two, the hypocrisy that was in the living of the people. Hmm, sounds a little familiar with today. I know that the Bible is millions of years ago and thousands of years ago, but when you start to consider that God could show up today and bring some charges against us because we formalize worship, we go through the motion, trying to do things that make us feel good versus trying to praise God. This isn't a performance. This is all about praise and worship the one true God. And the second charge that God could have against us is living in hypocrisy. See, we go around saying one thing and doing something different. Saying that we have all these moral beliefs and that we follow the one true God, yet we go around and do what we want. We go around and say what we want because we've convinced ourselves in our minds that we're grown folk and we do exactly what we want. What if God showed up today as judge bringing charges against us? You can sit there and say, that's not me. That's quite all right. I'm here all week. We can talk about it. Verse number eight. Verse number eight. God rebukes their sacrifices. What Israel failed to realize is that God didn't need their sacrifices, which brings us to the text today. See, God, where God reminds them in verse number 10, he says, every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. The fowls of the mountains is mine. The wild beasts of the field is mine. See, Israel was going around trying to formalize the sacrifice, thinking that they were doing something special, thinking that this cattle belonged to them. And they were giving it back to God as if they were doing something special. And God shows up and cracks their faces. He says, I don't need your bulls and your goats. You are bringing a sacrifice that belongs to me anyway. The sacrifice wasn't for me. The sacrifice is for you. It was because you had to prove that you were obedient. Israel needed to proclaim, we need to proclaim that I need God. I need to tap into his abundant resources. I need my little bit to be expanded to a whole lot of bit. In order to please him, in order him to bless me with a whole lot of it, sometimes we have to praise God when we don't feel like it. Sometimes we got to lift our hands up in the air when we don't really want to lift our hands in the air. Sometimes we got to be able to bring a praise or worship to God because he just simply wants your best praise and your best worship because the fact that he is who he is, we should praise him. It's mine. Your car is mine. Your family is mine. Your job is mine. Your money is mine. Your life is mine. And because it's mine, I can take it back any old time that I want to take it back. So because of the fact that he's allowed you to live in your house, to have your money, to have your life, to look at your family, they're still The car, he just allows me to lease it. It's on assignment to do what he wants me to do. Look at the second thing for your notes. It says, it's my business. Every now and then, we stick our noses in places where it doesn't belong. See, we want to know things because we think that it's going to enhance our lives. We think that there's something juicy on the other side. We know for a fact that it has nothing to do with our circumstances. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do about the situations that we're in. We just simply want to know why. Because we're nosy. Look at this. The funny thing that I found about nosy folk is, is that once they do find 
find out, they find out it wasn't even that juicy anyway. And that they wasted 10 minutes of their lives that they're never going to get back and they wish they wouldn't even have heard the news. That's the thing that I find interesting. Look, the truth be known, if we were truthful with ourselves, our own stuff is enough. We have our own drama, we have our own situation, we don't have time to stick our noses in everybody else's business, and we certainly don't have time to stick our noses in God's business. Don't be surprised if God responds one time, it's my business. Look at verse number 12. God has a response for Israel. After he indicates that all belongs to him, he says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. Hmm. God is not required to tell you anything. He is sovereign. He is holy. He doesn't have to tell you anything. He paid the cost to be the boss. He don't report to anybody. He's God and God all by himself. He doesn't report to you. You report to God. God tells you what to do. God has no responsibility to share anything with us. See, here's the thing that I found out. I came to a realization this week. If Jesus wanted to come back again today, that's his business. If he wanted to end the world today, that's his business. If he wanted to end your life today, that's his business. If God wanted to turn your situation around, that's his business. If God wanted you to experience his wonder working power, that's his business. God doesn't show you the full staircase of your life because of the fact that he just wants to share the next step. And if you have enough faith to climb the next step, he'll show you the next couple of steps. He has no responsibility to share your life's itinerary. He doesn't have to share with you tomorrow because quite honestly, baby, tomorrow ain't even a promise to you anyway. Now all that God has a responsibility to do is to tell us, to encourage us to walk by faith, not by sight, because there is none like him in all the world. You need to stay out of his business. It's none of your business. It's his business. That's just who he is. I'm just telling you that it's his business. The third thing I find that's kind of interesting in this text. Everything belongs to him. There was a song that we used to sing when I was a little fella. It simply said, he's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> he's got the whole world in his hands. And as a little fella, it's hard to understand how big God is. The vastness of God. The fact of the matter is, is that if he has the whole world in his hands, then he surely owns it. It belongs to him. How many times do you go around holding other people's stuff and driving in their cars and living in their house? He ain't paid for nothing and asked for nothing. But yet you claim that it's yours. We don't do that. Because it doesn't belong to us. But let somebody come into your house unannounced. Let somebody get in your car without an invitation. Let them come to your house and open up your refrigerator. The first word out of your mouth is, that belongs to me. So that's the thing that we need to understand about God. Look at the end of verse number 12. God makes a declaration. He says, the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Israel, just in case you were confused, Trinity, just in case you thought you owned some stuff, God wanted to set the record straight. He said, this world, it's mine. Not only the world, but the fullness of all that is in the world. Man, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm glad that you asked. Everything, every person, every animal, every rock, every mountain, every tree, every valley, every river, every stream, everything belongs to him. Since everything belongs to God, that should give you some confidence when you approach God. 
See, now I understand why the writer said, do not be afraid or discouraged. This battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. See, this sickness, it belongs to God. The controversy at work belongs to God. My husband won't do right. It belongs to God. My wife has issues. It belongs to God. These kids are driving me crazy. It belongs to God. My bills, my financial situation, my circumstances, it all belongs to God. And because it belongs to God, he can choose to do with it whatever he wants to do with it. That's why when you pray, you should pray for his will be done, not your will be done. That's why when you pray, you ought to take time to ask what God has for you versus what God can do for you. Sometimes we just got to pray to God and say, I want to worship him, not because I want anything, Master. I want to worship him for simply who you are. You're strong. You're mighty. You're everything. So when I start to see that he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got my mother and my father in his hands. He's got my brother and my sister in his hands. He's got his hands all in my life. I'm glad that he's got my future in his hands. He's got my trouble in his hands. He's got my sickness in his hands. He's got my healing in his hands. He's got my troubles and my trials and tribulations in his hands. And I tell you one thing, I'm glad that it's in his hand. Because he can do more with it in his hand than I can ever do anywhere else. Everything belongs to him. I just got by to tell you, that's who he is. He's our judge. He's our business associate. He reports to nobody. It belongs to him. That's who he is. He's an able. He's a fixer. He's a problem solver. That's who he is. He's a healer. He's a provider. That's who he is. If you tried him, has he ever failed you? Has he ever left you hanging? Has he never blessed your life? That's who he is. And one of these old days, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. I know one thing for sure is, there's no more crying there. We are going to see the king. There is no more dying there. We are going to see the king. I like how the song says hallelujah, which is our highest form of praise. It says hallelujah, which when I don't have anything else to say in my life, I just want to give God my best. I just want to reach out to God and let him know how wonderful he is in my life. We're going to see God 
for ourselves. For those who don't believe, won't you be surprised when you see it? But here's the opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ and make him your personal savior today. You don't have to long. Yesterday is gone. Stop worrying about what you did yesterday. God has already moved on. He is a moving God. So all you have to do is the day is the present. If you want to see Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, or you're looking for rededication of life to Jesus Christ, looking for a church home, or looking for prayer, any one of those four things, why don't you come?
our service where we like to welcome and greet our visitors. If you're visiting with us for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, we invite you to stand, give us your name, and tell us where you're visiting from. And tomorrow came. And we're walking through the market. So this time we're actually there to buy. 
and these women saw Fred and honed in on him. They swarmed and there were about six women with all kinds of purses and trinkets, and they kept saying, Liliana, Liliana. <laughs> and so we thought the women were joking because we didn't remember them. And Fred was like, no, those are the ladies. I told them tomorrow. And these women followed us through the market and back to the hotel, sat outside our hotel waiting for Fred. They told him, they didn't know much English, but they knew ATM. <laughs> Fred bought so many items from these women that he had to go buy a, a suitcase from the market just to get through the market. And, you know, it really clicked to me when Pastor was talking about we don't always have tomorrow. And these women put so much hope in seeing Fred tomorrow and so much hope in that they will be able to get a sale from Fred tomorrow. And it just makes me think about salvation and how we don't always have tomorrow. So I just pray that if it is on your heart and you want to give your life to Christ, do not delay, do not hesitate. He is ever present and ready and willing to accept you. Amen. And I am grateful that we have a baptism this morning. So if the family of Timothy Pope would like to come up and join us in the choir stand, we'll proceed with our baptism. Amen.
we finally came into the 21st century, and these brothers were here for like six, seven hours yesterday, trying to get it right. So we just thank God for them. We praise God for what he's doing. And Simeon got the opportunity to sit in the sanctuary for the first time in, I don't know, a year, maybe, maybe a year. But we thank God for him. Eventually we'll be back online through the camera on the wall, but until then, we got an iPad, so Amen. we will definitely do it then. Amen. Go ahead, Michael. with us now henceforth and forevermore. Let us all say. Amen. 